There we go. All right, lesson six of the end times. Welcome back, everybody. Um, you guys like living in the state of Minnesota when there's snow? Yes, you do? Yes. Yes. Thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> Thumbs down. <laughs> no, I love I love the seasons. I love spring. I love fall. Uh, did you miss fall? It was about three days. <laughs> and it is beautiful and the trees are colorful and I, but I'd like that. I wish it would just stay about 58 for, you know, like three months. I could, I love kind of that 58 and sunny and we had like a week of that and that's it. And uh, so, but that's why we spend a little time in Arizona in the wintertime the last few years and to get out of the worst of it. But uh, um, you know, people don't understand 30 degrees in Minnesota. You can walk around with a light coat, no problem, right? People don't know that. People don't understand that. They think we're just freezing. But when it gets, you know, below about four degrees or zero, below zero, then it's like, oh, this is cold. So you like that? Below zero? Yeah. Where were you born? You born? You were born here. Yeah. So you're native. Hmm, okay. Have you had her checked or just? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I used to love to ski and I'm just, I don't ski that much anymore. My wife's had knee surgery, so she doesn't ski anymore. So we don't do that kind of stuff. But what do we do during the winter? <laughs> go to oh, we go to Arizona. That's right. <laughs> and we try to hike every day. We have this three mile hike. We try to do all the time. We try to do that. And so stay fit. My, uh, my daughter who is actually taking this class on zoom, although I think they're going to walk, watch the YouTube, uh, this week. Oh, they're on? Yeah, she always says, uh, never forget, motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. You got to keep moving it, right? <laughs> Move it or lose it, the old adage goes. So, yeah, so don't do enough of that anymore, do we? All right. Well, um, this lesson, lesson six, we're going to finish up the characters because I never seem to get through all the characters in lesson five. So we well, I kind of have this baked into the plan that we need to finish up the character first, and then we'll start talking about some of the details of the events, and they're kind of intermingled. This two weeks is really the details of much of the book of Revelation. So we're going to, we're down in the details, we're down in the nitty gritty, we're talking about all these kind of, what is this trumpet, and we'll spend a little bit of time on that, but you'll notice we don't spend a lot of time on these kind of the details of the book of Revelation. I think staying up a little bit and understanding the big picture is more important. So we do spend these two weeks on all of the people and the characters and the events and what happens. And so we do see a bunch of the details. But um, I think a lot of times that I've seen studies on the book of Revelation, they'll spend, you know, an hour on the identity of the locusts, you know, in the in the in one of the trumpet judgments. And it's like, boy, I'm, we're going to spend about 40 seconds on the locusts, okay? And that's about it tonight, so. Um, admin, you guys came. There was, I guess, when this class was first listed on Grace Church's website, uh, that it was, there was no class night because this is MEA week. When I was growing, my kids were growing up, MEA was two days. Has it turned into a whole week or what? I don't, I don't get it. It was, it was two days when we were growing up, but, um, the what? Paid vacation. Paid vacation. That's right. It's like you don't already get three months off. Sorry. Any teachers here? Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. Okay. I was a teacher. I taught for four years at Southwest Christian, right? I taught biblical worldview for, uh, for, for a few years at Southwest. And uh, yeah, summer's off. Great. All right. Any other admin stuff? Was I going to... I don't think I had any other admin stuff. So let's get going on, the, finish up all the characters and then some of the events. So Lord, we look at this world and um, boy, it's just messed up in so many ways. But yet you say in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Why are we so surprised when the wicked world acts wicked? When those who don't know you and, and, uh, and uh, who are fools, you say a fool says in their heart, there is no God. And so why are we surprised when the world, the lost world, acts lost? And yet, Lord, uh, we, we specifically want to pray for our country. You say that, 
that uh, we are to pray for those in authority over us, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. So we lament the heights from which we have fallen as a nation. Uh, honoring you, our motto is still, in God we trust. Um, but we can envision a day today where uh, that just might get wiped away and erased. And so, Lord, as part of your body, we want to hold up our country, hold up our leaders, our governors, our our legislators, our judges, and ask that your righteousness prevail because righteousness exalts a nation. Lord, we just ask for your leading now as we study the details of your plan for the end of the age. We've read the back of the book, Lord, and you win in a big way, and uh, it's part of our inheritance, so we look forward to it, Lord, and we pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, how many of you have been led to pray for your country a little bit more in the last couple of years, huh? Yeah, isn't that something? All right, the events. Well, let's just jump in to where we left off last time, and that was with the two witnesses of Revelation. So chapter 11, so if you're following along, we're going to be kind of discussing some of the events of chapter 11 now. And John was given a read like a measuring rod, and um, and well, here's this 42 months and 1260 days again, that is two witnesses will prophesy for. Clothed in sackcloth, there are two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Well, we actually have pictures of these two lampstands in the Old Testament as well. So I think these two witnesses are two Old Testament characters that come back. So they prophesy. So what do we know about them from chapter 11? They prophesied for three and a half years. 1260 days. Do we know, is that the first or the second half? It's the first half. We don't know that for sure yet, but I'll show you how we can tell. It says fire comes out of their mouth. Anybody have that power? Does anybody have that spiritual gift? Fire out of your mouth kind of thing. So no one can harm them. And uh, so they obviously have kind of super powers from God. And yet this character, the beast, is going to eventually overcome them and kill them. Now in the, verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss, where does the beast come from again? From the abyss. Remember we looked at Revelation 17 where it says, he, the beast you saw once was, now is not, but is coming again up out of the abyss. So here it's confirming that, yes, in fact, that's where the beast comes from, from the abyss will attack them, overpower them, and kill them. Well, it just said that a couple verses before that if anybody wants to harm these two witnesses, they must die. These men have the power to shut up the sky so that it does not rain, and they have the power to turn water to blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Whoa, they got quite a bit of power, and yet this beast comes along and overcomes them and kills them. All right, hang on to that. So the bodies will lie in the streets for three and a half days, Revelation 11, 8 says. <coughs> Excuse me. And now if you notice, I tried to cover the mic here for the Zoom guys. Sorry about that coffee. Their bodies lie in the street for three and a half days. And if you noticed in the readings, when you're reading this, did you notice the two different reactions? I tried to highlight this in the homework. The first reaction is from the, those from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's the TTPM. We like to call them the TTPM for short. And they gaze on their bodies and they say, don't bury them. Now, the rest of the earth or the earth dwellers, or sometimes it says those who are the inhabitants of the earth or dwell on the earth, they are celebrating. They're rejoicing. These guys are gone and dead. They tormented those that wanted to harm them. Can you imagine the lost world having a couple guys proclaiming God supernaturally to the world? They want them gone. And they finally are gone and they celebrate. Do you see what they did when they celebrated? What'd they do? Hmm? Give each other gifts. They what? Give each other gifts. They give each other gifts. They send gifts to each other. Isn't that strange? Yeah. It's like the whole world is celebrating that these two guys are gone. But wait a minute. What's going to happen to these two guys? 
Are they going to come back to life? Now, why do you suppose the TTPN were refusing them uh, their burial? Why did they say, no, 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 don't bury them, leave them there? Why do you suppose they did this? Now, this is not in scripture, but I think we can conclude this from what happens next. I think they knew that these guys were going, some, I bet, now this is, I don't have a Bible verse for this, but I'm guessing that while they were prophesying about the kingdom of God, about Christ, they probably said, and if you strike us down, remember Jesus said, strike down this temple and I'll raise it up again in three days. I bet they prophesied that if you strike us down, we'll come back to life. And sure enough, what happens? They come back to life. Now, this two reactions is very important because which one is looking for proof that these two guys were speaking the truth? And which group is just kind of writing them off and celebrating and happy that they're gone? So we see in Revelation 7, one of our other people groups, it turned to Revelation 7 really quick. And John sees, verse 9, after this I look, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's why we call this group the TTPN. Standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They're in hell, heaven now. And later on in verse 14, John says, where, where did these guys come from? And the angel says, sir, you know. And he says, these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robe and made them white by the blood of the Lamb. They're believers. And they've died during the tribulation. And now we see a great multitude of them up in heaven. Now, these guys, it doesn't say how they've died, right? But did you guys read some of the trumpets and some of the bowls and some of the wars and the stuff's going on during this seven-year period? Are believers even going to die during this time? Yeah, you bet. And so we see a great multitude. So here's one of the big purposes of the tribulation that some commentators will say, well, nobody has a second chance during the tribulation. If you haven't believed by the time of the rapture, you're out of luck. And I've heard that taught. And it's like, haven't you read chapter seven? It says there's a great multitude that comes out of the great tribulation from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. I think those are the same ones that said, no, don't bury those guys. They said they were going to rise and I'm going to watch it happen. And sure enough, it does. I think they then believed them, many, many of them, a great multitude that no one could count from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Now, the earth dwellers are another story. They are described in scripture as being judged, as worshiping the beast, whose names are not li uh, listed in the Lamb's Book of Life. They were the ones who were celebrating. So these earth dwellers, I think, are the ones that are not saved during the tribulation. Remember in scripture in the gospels, Jesus, especially in John, you see it a number of places in John, Jesus would preach and some liked the message and followed after him, but others wanted to kill him, right? Two distinct reactions. Whenever Christ is taught, have you ever talked about God with somebody and they seem kind of interested and asked you questions and, you know, well, how can we know and stuff like that? And then have you talked to someone who's just rejected you and said, oh, you don't believe that stuff, do you? Both reactions. It's kind of like, it's kind of like at night, you know, you flip on a light. You're the light of this world, right? Jesus was the true light that came into the world, but some men love the darkness and they scurry away from the light but other light other insects are am i just do i just compare people to moths here <laughs> but other insects are attracted to the light i think it's the exact same way and here we see the two different reactions from these two witnesses all right Can I ask a question about the TTP? yeah so don't have both gentiles and jews then right if it says from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, it, it, there are some who believe this is only representative of the Gentiles, 
but I think many, many Jews will be saved as well. Now, remember, who were the 144,000 that we saw last week? They were all Jews. So I think the picture is, and I don't show this on the timeline per se, but I think the two witnesses actually come first. I think right at the start of the tribulation, these two witnesses show up. They prophesy for 1260 days. Back one slide. And so they're there the whole three and a half years of the first period. It doesn't say when the 144,000 start. I just, I think they start early on. Well, I bet they are the first converts, <coughs> the first converts of the two witnesses prophesying in Jerusalem. You now have 144,000 super evangelists. They go out into the world, and then we end up having a great multitude. So you see that? The two witnesses, the 144,000, and then a great multitude. So yes, that's one of God's great purposes of the tribulation is to save a whole bunch of people. You see that? And, and a whole bunch of people are saved. All right. Yes, ma'am. Why do they refuse to bury? Because I think they want to watch them rise from the grave. I'm sorry, rise again, come back to life, because I believe it's likely that they preached that you destroy us and we'll come back to life again. And so, um, and, and remember, I don't have a Bible verse for that, but it makes sense kind of logically, that they would have preached that if you knock this down, we'll come back to life again. So two witnesses come, they're sent from heaven, and we'll get to their identity here in a minute. Uh, when we... Two witnesses. Where's their identity stuff? Hang on. All right, hang on a second, guys. Where's my identity stuff? I just had it up at home. Let me do this. <sighs> hmm? Where I must have forgot to copy this in. All right, now I got to go back to Zoom. Is it up? No. There. Okay. So now I got to go to Zoom, and then um, Zoom meeting, share screen. This is going to be a bummer because I'm going to have to do this again. Um. All right, uh, will you check the chat on the Zoom and make sure everybody can see uh, that slide again? I see it, yeah. Okay. And it's still recording. And it's still recording. All right, I don't know where that where it went from. So the great multitude in heaven comes out of the great tribulation. We see them in heaven. So many, many people get saved. That's the slide I was looking for. So who are the two witnesses? Um, I think that... Scripture actually tells us the identity of one of them, of the first one, and I think that is Elijah. And if you go to Malachi chapter 4, God tells us, so this is the last, last book of the Old Testament. He says, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I think that's the second coming. So before the second coming, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, God says he'll send us the prophet Elijah. Now, if you remember, many people thought Jesus might be Elijah. And why did they think that? Because of this passage. The Jews were looking for him. So many of the Jews thought John the Baptist was Elijah. Many thought Jesus was Elijah. But Jesus clearly answered them and said, no, I'm not Elijah. 
because he's not, all right? <laughs> he's Jesus. Um, but they were looking for this Elijah, and they missed the fact from the prophecy that this coming of Elijah will be in the end times as one of the two witnesses before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the day that Jesus comes and treads the wine press of the wrath of God. And if you recall, Elijah had similar powers when he was on earth before. So he's kind of acting consistent with his Old Testament uh, um, you know, life as well. The other person, the other witness, I believe, is Enoch. Now, if you remember Enoch, we actually only have a couple verses about Enoch, but it says something interesting that Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. He was taken up to heaven. And so these are the two characters in the Old Testament that didn't die. Remember, Elijah was brought up in a fiery chariot, and Enoch was translated somehow up to heaven as well. And so they are the two characters that never died in scripture in the Old Testament. And we just so happen to have two characters come back from heaven who need to die again because the beast is going to kill them, which is why I don't think the other character, as many will teach, is Moses because Moses actually died. But some people say that, for example, at the transfiguration, who was present there. It was Elijah and Moses, and that they somehow represent the law and the prophets. So it's got to be Elijah and Moses. And remember, they did fight over Satan's body, so they think that has something to do with it, but he died. And so I think that the fact that Moses has died, and it says in scripture that it's appointed to men to die once and then face judgment, I think that precludes Moses from being the second character. I think we have two characters that were caught up to heaven. We have two characters that come back from heaven. God names one of them, Elijah, and I think Enoch is the second one. Okay, make sense? Yeah. All right, then we have this character in, called Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. So turn to Revelation 17 and 18, and this woman is something, I tell you, a lot of descriptions about this woman. She is seen riding the beast. And I think this is during the first half of the tribulation that the woman is riding the beast. So the woman, this mystery Babylon, is riding. Now, if she's the rider, who's more in control, do you think? She is, huh? She's riding the beast. She's called a great prostitute who sits on many waters and has committed many adulteries. Her colors are purple, purple, scarlet, and gold. She is drunk with the blood of the saints. So she has killed many Christians, many believers. She sits on seven hills. Many peoples and worldwide influence she has. Many luxuries. She's rich. She sits as a queen and she's a city, a great city. In fact, on four different occasions, this harlot, this mystery Babylon, is called a city. So, of all of the candidates of who is mystery Babylon, we're going to narrow it down very quickly to a city because scripture says it is a city. So, here are the candidates that are commonly. Uh, thought is the identity of mystery Babylon. Number one is us, this harlot, this adulterer, this, our sins rise up to heaven. We do have worldwide influence. We have influence over many kingdoms for sure, but do we sit on seven hills? Are we a city? And the answer is, well, no. I mean, even if you were to represent America by Washington, D.C., or even New York or something, those don't sit on seven hills. D.C. is on a swamp that needs to be drained, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I told myself I wasn't going to get political, and then... <coughs> but it does. Okay, right, number two, the common, another common interpretation is a, a false religious system, kind of the world's false religious system. Many will go back to the Tower of Babel, and they tried to become their own god, and, 
and uh, and that that system of false religious systems are still at work and at play today. Is the false religious system a city, however? No, it's not a city. It's kind of a worldwide influence. Okay, the next candidate is literal Babylon. So this harlot is called mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abomination of the earth. I saw the woman and she was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Did literal Babylon kill any saints? Didn't. Now, some will teach that mystery Babylon is somehow a resurrected, not resurrected in a resurrected, but a Babylon, a renewed Babylon. It's going to be rebuilt and it's going to come back. And that new Babylon, and where is Babylon, by the way, today? What country? Iraq. And that new Babylon is going to be rebuilt. And that is going to be the center of the Antichrist's uh, kingdom. That will, that's where he'll dwell in Iraq. Now, if you saw Saddam Hussein was actually trying or thinking that he wanted to build Babylon, but we know what happened to him and he didn't get very far, right? And besides, of literal Babylon, when she was judged by God, remember God used Babylon against Israel, but because she was still doing evil to Israel, God came and judged Israel. Babylon, he then says multiple times in the book of Jeremiah that when I judge her, she's going to be desolate forever. I believe God. Can Babylon come back? No. And besides, why would you call literal Babylon mystery Babylon? You see that? But Babylon, God says, will be desolate forever, Jeremiah 51, never to be inhabited again, Isaiah 13. I think the destruction of literal Babylon is prophetic of the destruction, the future destruction of mystery Babylon, but I don't think they're the same. Real Babylon's destruction just points the way to the destruction of mystery Babylon. All right, next candidate. So it's not not literal Babylon. By the way, how many of you, again, read the Left Behind series? Yeah, where was Babylon? It was literal Babylon, I believe, in that Left Behind series. But I don't think so. God said it would be desolate forever. All right, the next city. Now, this one is a city. Is Jerusalem a city? Yes. Is Jerusalem called a... Uh, I thought I had it on there, but it's not. Is, is Jerusalem called an adulteress by God? Did she follow? At, what is spiritual adultery, by the way? Falling after other gods. Did Jerusalem follow after other gods? Is she called an adulteress by God? Yes. So does God divorce the unfaithful adulteress? Has he written, Jeruz has he written Israel off completely? No, he hasn't. That's next week. We're going to see that next week. He hasn't. What? Why is that funny? I always say next week. What did I say? Did I misspeak? Oh, well, I, I'll, I'm, I'm going to go look at the tape and then I'll have a good laugh, I guess. huh? So Israel, God is not done with Israel. He has not written Israel off, even though he has called Jerusalem and Israel an adulterous nation because they have followed after God. So she meets that criteria. She is an adulteress. Did she kill the saints? Well, did Israel, did the Jews kill some Christians? Well, yeah. Didn't the Jews bring even Jesus before Rome? <gasps> Rome. Oh, hang on. Yes. Yes. But many of the other things, like sitting on seven hills, although some people identify seven mountains within Israel, within Jerusalem proper, but here's the, here's the nail that eliminates Jerusalem as a potential candidate for Mystery Babylon. Of Mystery Babylon, Mystery Babylon is going to be judged just like literal Babylon was judged and be no more. Okay, that's what's going to happen to Mystery Babylon. Of Israel, God says 
that she will be inhabited forever. So can Jerusalem be Mystery Babylon? No, she can't. Which leaves Rome. Rome. Now, all right, pause. It's at this point that I'm, I need to make a special announcement to the class because I have had uh, individuals over the years that uh, I had one lady bring a friend of hers to this class and she was of the Roman Catholic tradition. And she up to this point said, this is the best study she'd ever been to. She was so excited. She was getting to know God in a, in a way that she never had in her entire life until we got to this lesson. And she turned in her book to her friend and said, I'm not coming back. All right. So here's my special announcement. Please listen carefully. We are going to identify this mystery Babylon. And if you saw what was the last candidate there was Rome. But I am going to be speaking about the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and not about individual Catholics who may or may not prescribe to all of the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and who may be genuine believers in Christ Jesus, are there believers in Grace Church? Are there unbelievers in Grace Church? Are there believers in Catholic churches around our country? You bet. Are there unbelievers in Catholic churches? Yes. But I'm going to be speaking about the teachings of Roman Catholicism. Deal? Deal. Sounds good. All right. Everybody shake my hand, and that's a deal. So back to Mystery Babylon. It is a city. Rome is a city. Historically, Rome is known as the city on seven hills. Rome is also known as Babylon. Read 1 Peter 5.13. Peter actually calls Rome Babylon. And so calling her Mystery Babylon is consistent with Scripture. She is a harlot a spiritual adulteress. And what I mean by that is Rome teaches a false gospel. All right? I'm going to show that to you in a minute with a slide because this is a very serious, you know, kind of conclusion that Rome teaches a false gospel. But I'm going to use Rome's own words to show you this because what's the true gospel? We're saved by faith alone in Christ's work on the cross, alone. Amen? Amen? Not by works. Rome definitely has worldwide influence. Rome is most likely the wealthiest entity on the planet. The wealthiest entity on the planet. Her colors are the colors that are described in the book of Revelation. And the golden cup that's in her hand, as described in Revelation, well, the chalice is used uh, weekly at every mass in every Catholic institution. She claims to be the eternal city. Rome does. What's the eternal city? What's the only eternal city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The ruler, the Antichrist, is of the people who destroy the sanctuary. So there's a connection of the Antichrist to the people of Rome. And remember, the Roman Empire was never defeated. It just went into the church. So the Antichrist and the woman are going to be partners in the first half of the tribulation. The Roman Empire never fell. The woman is also drunk with the blood of the saints. Rome, both the kingdom and the church, is probably responsible for more Christian deaths than any other entity in the world. And if you understand Rome's history, the inquisitions throughout the Middle Ages across Europe, uh, there are millions, 6 to 12 million Christians, faithful Christians, who were killed in the inquisitions across Europe because they didn't agree with the doctrines of Rome. And Rome is actually the one who killed Christ and the early Christians, right? The lion's den, those were all in Roman Colosseums. Some of the emperors turned and started persecuting Christians and killing them. So there is no entity on the face of the earth 
that is responsible for killing more Christians than Rome. The Bible states that justification is not by works. You see the Bible passages there. Because our works are like filthy rags to God. So if we are going to become the righteousness of God, it can't be based on what we do. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 makes that clear, right? We're saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's by faith alone in Christ alone. Yet Rome declares, and it has from its beginnings, and it declares even to this day, that if you say that you're saved or justified by faith alone, let him be anathema. Let him be condemned. All right? So Rome declares even today that if you claim that you are saved by faith alone, you should be condemned because that goes against Roman Catholicism teaching. And that's why I used the phrase earlier, it's a false gospel. It's a false gospel of grace plus works. All right? Now, today, the reason we have to be very careful with this is because today our ecumenical spirit is what drives all of our opinions instead of our discernment to the word of God. So it's kind of like, can't we just all get along? Aren't we just all Christians? Aren't we just all different denominations and have the same beliefs? And the answer is no, we don't. We have to look to see what they actually believe. So when we look at Rome, and someday I'm going to do a whole semester class on the slide that we're about to see, but right now, we're just going to go through them quickly, because I just want you to get a feel for the teachings of Rome that go against biblical Christianity, okay? Starting with salvation, we just saw. Infant baptism. Does infant baptism get anybody to heaven? Is that exclusive to Rome, by the way? No, it's done in many Reformed churches as well. Mary worship, even Mary as a co-redeemer. What is the only gate, the only door, the only way to God? Jesus. Through Christ. There's no intermediate step of Mary. And yet Rome will put Mary in between you and Christ, which means she's between you and God. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. They claim the Catholic Church is the one true church. What is the one true church? Believers, the body of Christ, that's the one true church. The Pope is the head of the church. Who's the head of the church? Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Is the Pope infallible? They claim he is. I would say no, he's not. Peter's authority is said to be the first Pope and that there's an unbroken chain from Peter onto the modern day Pope. That historically is just not true. The Pope is called the Vicar of Christ or Christ's uh, represent, representation on earth. Who represents Christ on earth? We do. You are the light of the world. You are an ambassador of Christ. You represent Christ in this world. Not one man, but every single person who believes in Christ. You are the Vicar of Christ. Rome is the eternal city. No, Jerusalem is. Purgatory, an unbiblical doctrine, because we know that once you die, your fate is sealed. There's no going from good to bad or back and forth. It's an unbiblical doctrine. Indulgences. You could pay money to the church and they would pray to get your dead relatives out of purgatory up to heaven. Well, that's a pretty lucrative business. <laughs> If your spouse or loved one or child died and you didn't know if they're in heaven or not, how much would you give? I'd give everything I got. That was one of Martin Luther's top points, by the way. Salvation by faith alone and indulgences. I probably should have put that up in number two because that was a couple of his primary points and his thesis that he nailed to the Witt Witt Wittenberg? Wittenberg door? Castle? Yeah, yeah. Through suffering, through your suffering, 
you can atone for your own sin. And if you suffer enough, you can atone for the sins of others. Saints are declared by the church. Who declares a believer a saint? God does. Every single person in Christ Jesus is declared a saint or holy by God. In the Catholic denomination, in the Catholic tradition, who is declared a saint? What's the qualifications? Well, the first thing is you have to die. So that's kind of a bummer. In fact, you got to be dead for five years. And then someone declares you blessed and then venerable. And then if there's miracles in your life, you can be declared a saint or there's a whole process. You can pray to saints in the Catholic church. And by the way, pray to Mary. Who's the only one we are to pray to biblically? God. Priests are ordained by the church. No, we are all priests and ministers of the gospel. We are a holy priesthood. Every single believer is. Celibacy requirements for priests, is that a requirement biblically? No. Paul says he was, but he says not everybody can handle it. So it's not a requirement. And by the way, it's caused a lot of problems in, in the Catholic Church, I would argue. Communion elements actually become the body and the blood of Christ based on Jesus saying, this is my body broken for you. And so on the, on the, on the mass table, it's called transubstantiation. The wafer and the blood actually become the body and the blood of Christ without appearing to be the blood and the body of Christ. But they are literally the body of Christ. So you're literally eating the flesh of Christ at the mass in Catholicism. That's called transubstantiation. Confession of priests for remission of sins. No, we confess to God for salvation and, and forgiveness of sins. We have different categories of sins. We have different holy days. Uh, and the sin of presumption, the sin of presumption is basically says that I remember watching Pope John Paul II be interviewed towards the end of his popidness. What do you call it? Pope, pap papal, 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 papalness, papacy. Thank you. There you go. Papacy. And the interviewer asked him, do you think you're going to heaven? What do you think he said? I hope so. He said, I hope so. He said, I hope so. No. Because in Catholicism, if you say you know you're going to heaven, that is the sin of presumption. Even though John writes at the back of 1 John, you're not, and you know where I'm going. I write these things to those who believe so that you may no. know that you have eternal life. His spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We can know that we know that we know. Yes, sir. So I'm a former Catholic. Yep. Catholic a long time. Got out of that about 14 years ago. And did I did I do okay with the list here? I recommend the book. It's called The Gospel According to Rome. Yeah, good book. Outstanding book that compares the Catholic Church to the to the to the Bible. Yeah, so he's recommending a book called The Gospel According to Rome. It is. I've paged through that book. I can't remember the author. Uh, maybe someone can Google it and let me know on their phone here. But uh, yeah, the gospel according to Rome, I think, I, I mean, I don't know how many of these that it covers or not. This is just a list that I've oh, developed over the years. Everyone. Every one of them. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's no heirs. There's no legitimate heirs that could claim uh, uh, any kind of ownership over any church assets or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why the celibacy requirement is there. So you, you don't have that. But, um, yeah, so look, here's the bottom line. If you're going to find a candidate for Mystery Babylon, they have to meet all the criteria. The other cities that I mentioned, Jerusalem and literal Babylon, don't meet all the criteria. And I think there's only one city that does, and that is Rome, specifically Vatican City, which is in the city 
of Rome, which is traditionally the city that sits on seven hills. The article that is in the homework from last lesson is uh, a city on seven hills written by Dave Hunt. And if you wanna study this issue more, uh, and, and I have a spreadsheet and I've, I've outlined every description that's in Revelation 17 and 18 and all the candidates that we have. And I compared characteristic by characteristic by characteristic. And there's only one that meets them all. And that is Rome. And this book, A Woman Rides the Beast uh, by Dave Hunt is, uh, is probably the best book on the subject that I know of, if you want to find out more, how Rome is the harlot of Revelation. Now, this is not a new teaching, by the way. Um, and it, it, it's only controversial in the last decades, because this ecumenical movement within the church is very powerful, right? We all get along. I know people that insist that Mormonism is just another uh, denomination of the Christian church, and they are not. Mormonism has a false God and a false Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Mormon Jesus is a created being. The Christ of the Bible is the creator of all. They're light years apart. All right? So we need to guard our doctrine closely. And so when I see the doctrines of a teaching from any group and compare it and always compare it to the Bible, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I do when Troy speaks from this pulpit, and that's when I do what I do when I read the teachings of Rome, or any person on the radio, or any article I read, or any, you get the point. Martin Luther was convinced that Rome was the harlot of Revelation. We are not to first to declare the papacy to be the kingdom of the Antichrist, since for many years before us, and so many and such great men, whose number is large and whose memory is eternal, have undertaken to express the same thing so clearly and plainly. William Durant wrote, the Roman church, they were sure, uh, was the whore of Babylon. Such was the opinion even of many leading Roman Catholics in the Middle Ages. For example, St. Bonaventure, Cardinal and General of the Franciscans, said that Rome was just like the harlot of the apocalypse. And others have declared, did not hesitate with the ref reformers of the 16th century to say that Roman Catholicism is, the scripture puts it, the whore of Babylon. So this is not new. It's just, I think, become more controversial in a way in the last handful of years, decades, as we become more ecumenical. Yes, sir. What do you think the, the overall reason is for becoming more ecumenical? Like, it, it just seems that if everyone has their own beliefs or their own theory of who Christ is and and, we're in, in God and what their positioning is, why would they want to blend those together to make them more vanilla rather than individual? I don't know. Even, even the Lutheran church, which was kind of founded by Martin Luther, who almost lost his life when he disagreed with Rome, has now come back and said, oh, you know that whole disagreement for 500 years, it basically wasn't nothing. We, we basically agree on stuff now. And they, uh, they actually had a program called uh, Catholics and Lutherans Together, Evangelize 2000, and other documents that they've signed that basically said, oh, let's get rid of our differences. I, I think it's the whole, you know, can't we just all get along kind of mentality that we see today. You know, kind of this pluralistic attitude. There's no real truth. You can have your truth. I can have my truth and we can just get along. Um, and I think that's what's been driving this kind of ecumenical movement, even within the church. I think those kind of ideas have come into the church as well. Um, so how many times do you really find Christian leaders who are willing to stand up and say, no, that's a false teaching? And I think it's getting rarer and rarer, unfortunately. And so people don't want to say this. There might be some people who don't like me. Look, a lady got up and left the class. And I've had other people leave because of this as well. But any honest evaluation of the descriptions of Mystery Babylon will, if it's honest, will point to Rome, period. It really will. 
Um, and this, by the way, has been, even been the view of the evangelical church, yet that opinion has been abandoned by many evangelicals. Um, and, and I could list off a whole slew of them who basically have declared publicly that Roman Catholicism is basically just one other denomination of Christianity. And I just fundamentally disagree. I don't think they are, based on their words alone in their teaching. All right? Blah, I hate that stuff. But you have to say it. And there's two chapters in Revelation about this. And it says, remember what it says that if you read it, it says, come out of her, my people. And it's like, are there believers in this organization? Yeah, there are. Come out of her. Come out of her, my people. All right. Um, oh, what do I want to do here? Yeah, I, I guess uh, just, I don't have a ton of time to go over this. How many of you are familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue from Daniel chapter two? All right, most of you, right? I even joked about the VeggieTales show about bowing down to the bunny, remember? None of you saw it. You got to go watch it. It's on YouTube, I think. Go watch it. That's your assignment for this week. Go watch VeggieTales. Which, which episode is that? It's not called Bow Down to the Bunny. It's, no, it's Daniel uh, No, that's Daniel in the Lion's Den. It's what? Oh, Red Shack, Meshach, and Abednego. That's probably the name of it, right? Rack Shack and Benny. That's what their friends call them, right? Thank you. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he sees a head, and the breast and arms are silver, and the belly was brass, and the legs were iron, and then he sees feet which was iron mixed with clays with 10 toes. And then this rock comes and destroys the whole statue. Uh, let's start at this last one. What's the rock that destroys all the kingdoms of the world? Who's the rock? Christ. It's Christ. It says a rock not cut by human hands comes and destroys the statue. So there's an eventual Christ is going to come. I would argue that's the second coming of Christ when he is going to establish his kingdom, no more earthly kingdom. But the head we know is Babylon. The beast and the arms were prophetic for the next kingdom that was going to come, and that was the Medes and the Persians, the two arms, right? They came together in one kingdom, and that's when they reigned. By the way, this parallels another vision that Daniel has in Daniel chapter 7 of the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the beast, the dreadful and terrifying beast. Uh, but I, that's all I'll mention there. The next kingdom is the Greek kingdom, and then Rome. And so Rome is the legs of iron that tramples everything before it. Very powerful. But then it talks about another kingdom that comes after this. But it's still connected to the legs. It still seems part of the legs. And it's basically what we call the revived Roman Empire. In between the Rome of old, and the revived Rome that is to come, the kingdom of the Antichrist, there's a gap, a prophetic gap. And we don't know how long that gap is going to be, but we know this kingdom of 10 toes is going to come. There are a bunch of images in scripture with the 10, the 10 horns, the 10 ho toes, the 10 kingdoms that give the beast his power and authority. And so we see this number 10 over and over again in terms of the revived Roman Empire or the empire of the beast, the future kingdom that is to come. And it is a dreadful and terrifying beast with 10 horns. And then, of course, the Son of Man comes and destroys them all. So why do I bring that up? It's because there is this connection in Scripture between the empire of Rome and the church of Rome that then has a role to play in the end times. And I think she shows up as the harlot, as Mystery Babylon, riding the beast, who is also of the people who destroy the sanctuary, remember? The beast comes out of the people that destroyed the sanctuary, which is Rome. So actually, when the European Union started up, and there happened to be 10 countries in the European Union, 
and we had all these 10 references in the Bible, and Rome was basically Europe and the Mediterranean, the area of the Mediterranean, and everybody said, oh, the European Union is the kingdom of the beast. Well, it may morph into that, but it's not, because now the European Union has well over 10 members. It's got 20 some odd members. I can't remember how many today, although one less, right? Britain, Brexit, one less member. But this is a picture of the woman riding the beast outside the EU Parliament building in Brussels. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, is this life imitating art or art imitating life or, 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 or sculptures imitating prophecy or I don't know what this is, but they see it in this kind of prophetic way, just a story. They obviously don't think it's real in any way, shape or form. And they've got this, it's actually called Europa, but it's a woman riding this beast. It's also a coin. I actually have one of these coins. Here's the woman riding the beast. Now the beast doesn't have 10 heads and so on like this picture. This is a picture that from this Pat um, Meraki lady, Revelation Illustrated. And here she comes, the beast coming up out of the sea and she's got the woman. So you see the woman riding the beast, the first half of the tribulation, but the beast will destroy the woman. Well, now we've got this picture. We got this, 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 wait a minute. I thought they were working together. I thought the beast and the woman, two different characters, this, this ruler, this man from the abyss as the beast being ridden by this woman, Rome, this harlot, and aren't they working together? If you read, uh, I, I probably, I think page three of the homework, it got to Revelation 17 and 18. The beast is going to destroy the woman. Why? Oh, I already put it up there. Why? Well, we'll just talk about it. Because at the midpoint of the tribulation, the beast declares himself to be God. And Satan is going to indwell him. And he's going to be the most powerful person on the earth. In fact, he's going to kill the two witnesses. He's that, that much power. Remember, nobody could touch the two witnesses. But now that he's indwelt by Satan, we'll see that in a minute, he's got ultimate power on earth. Does he need a religious system anymore if he's God on earth? And I think that's why. I don't need you anymore. I'm God. I set myself up in the temple of God, declaring myself to be God. Thessalonians says. Does God need a church? No. So he destroys the woman, leaves her behind, and the beast on his own begins to rule for the second half of the tribulation, which is exactly what Satan has wanted all along, right? To rule the earth. And now he gets to rule the earth. And what does he get to rule over? God pouring out his bold judgments on the earth. There you go, Satan. Rule the earth. For the second half of the tribulation, it's all yours. You get to rule over God pouring out his bold judgments, which we'll see in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Any questions on this harlot, this woman? How many of you already knew that the Harwood was Rome or thought it was Rome? Yeah. Kind of. So a couple of these. Eh, maybe. Huh? You read the book, The Woman Rights of East? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good book. And it uh, it, you know what? One of the things that it does is document the history of Rome in a way that I was not familiar with. They don't teach that you know, in, in high school. So, yeah. Next character. So the beast, the, the woman who rides the, the uh, mystery Babylon, the harlot is in Revelation 17 and 18. Okay, so we've covered 17 and 18. Um, Israel. Israel is a... Uh, a big deal when it comes to the end times. In fact, next week, we're going to cover just 
Israel. It's that big a deal to understanding the end times. I've kind of already hinted at this fact. But the final week of judgment, remember, is Daniel's 70th seven, a judgment proclaimed for his people and his holy city. The final judgment, the whole tribulation, the whole idea of a future seven-year period is Daniel's judgment from Daniel chapter 9. Remember Daniel chapter 9 five weeks ago? So that's what the tribulation is all about. It's a judgment declared upon Israel, Daniel chapter 9. We know the temple is going to be rebuilt someplace. Now, some believe that the Dome of the Rock has to be knocked down in order for that temple to be rebuilt. There are actually a number of archaeologists that believe, no, it can actually be built right here. That's where the old temple actually stood. And you know what's, you know what's here? Nothing. In other words, it's, it's potentially possible that the temple can be rebuilt and the Dome of the Rock not be knocked down. Why is that important? What would happen if they tried to knock down the Dome of the Rock? I mean, there would be World War III, wouldn't there? Yeah. But you might create some kind of negotiated agreement where they would have the right to build, rebuild their temple. And I think I mentioned this in week one or two. The Temple Institute is ready today to rebuild this temple. They're ready to go. They even have the red heifers. Did we talk about that in this class? Yeah, we did. Yeah, they even have red heifers. So they've got priests trained. They have the garments. They have the menorah. You can go to Israel right at the Temple Mount. In fact, right by the Wailing Wall, which is on the other side, right about here. And up from there, right about there, is the menorah. It's enclosed in secure plexiglass, but it's a gold menorah about this high. Yay high. It's ready to go into the holy place in the temple right now, today. It's ready to go. They've got everything ready to go. But if they tried to start building today, it uh, yeah, there'd be issues. There'd be problems. We're going to see that the dragon or Satan is going to make war against Israel at the midpoint when he indwells the Antichrist. And Israel is going to have to flee. Go back to Matthew 24. We covered this in week three. That when he sets up the abomination of desolation in a rebuilt temple of God here, that he's going to go make war against Israel. And so Israel is going to have to flee out of Israel where she goes to the wilderness and taken care of for three and a half years. So I think that's the second three and a half years. But then we'll see, especially next week, that when Jesus comes... There's going to be a surviving remnant of Israel that is going to be saved. They will look upon him who they have pierced. And finally, finally, Israel, the nation of Israel, will recognize their Messiah, and they will enter into the millennial kingdom. Cool. That's what it means when Romans 11.26 says, so all Israel will be saved. So, but... We're only going to do one slide on Israel because we're going to cover Israel next week. It's a big deal. Next character. Yes. Well, Israel will rebuild the temple. Okay. Probably the, I mean, I'm sure the Temple Institute will have a role to play in rebuilding the temple. They're kind of seem to be the key people. Okay. Uh, but obviously, remember, the Temple Mount is administered by Islam. I'm sorry, by Arabs, by Palestinians. They administer this, but you're, if you're a Jew, you can go up there. But actually, there's a sign. When you try to get on the Temple Mount, there's actually a sign there by the Orthodox Jews that says, if you're a Jew, do not go up on the Temple Mount. Why would they say that? It's holy, but there's one particular spot that is the holy of holies, right? Right? Someplace up here, the Holy of Holies stood, and the Orthodox Jews don't want you to go up there because they don't want you to walk through where the Holy of Holies was. That would defile it in some way and dishonor God. So we went up there. I don't know if I walked through the Holy of Holies. You know, when my hair caught on fire that one time, though, that might have been it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got a question for you. Oh, I love this question. How many of you have seen the, uh, you guys know the answer. Okay, you guys, you can't answer this, all right? How many of you have seen the, uh, the traveling uh, Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle exhibit when I was in town? Did you guys see it? Did you see it? Did you see it? It was at Wooddale, Wooddale? It was in Wooddale's parking lot. Right, so Wooddale, so don't walk through Wooddale's parking lot either anymore. You might walk through the hallway of holy places. So I'm standing there. We were with a group of friends. We had, I don't know, a dozen or 15 or so of us there. And we were kind of the first ones out. And you went in little groups and stopped at each station. And so all the rest of the groups came out over. And I had this question. I thought this question. Once the group all got assembled, I thought, oh, this is a good question. I'm going to ask you guys the same thing. How many of you, by a show of hands, if we found the real Ark of the Covenant, would touch the Ark of the Covenant? I'm going to ask yes, and then I'll ask no. If we found the real Ark of the Covenant, we set it right here. Now, you all know the stories of the Old Testament, right? The guys that tried to save it from sliding off, and they died immediately, and so on. And Dagon, remember Dagon, the god that fell down before? I mean, all that power and all the stuff. And we all saw Indiana Jones, right? So we all, <laughs> don't look at the ark. Don't look at it. Okay. Um, so show of hands, how many of you would touch the Ark of the Covenant? So you already know the answer, right? You can't vote either. How many of you would not touch the Ark of the Covenant? All right, let the record show that about 80% of the people didn't vote. Here. <laughs> all right, I want you to all put your answers in the chat session. If you're on Zoom, I want you to text, put your chat in and say, I would touch it or I wouldn't touch it. Go ahead, vote. I'll give you a second. <laughs> Nobody's voted yet. <laughs> There we go. Okay, 13, 14, two people, three people, four. Okay, you're voting. All right, here we go. So I want I want if you raised your hand, how many would definitely touch the Ark of the Covenant? We got, I, I'm gonna do I, I didn't do this to the group, by the way. I want the four of you to stand up for a second. Okay, stand up for a second. Stand up. You raised your hand. If you would touch the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, you know, you can stand up. We know. Yeah, you guys raise your hand. Stand up back there. If the God of the universe, you know where I'm going? Can I change my answer? All I said was the God of the universe. You want to change your answer? Yeah, you're going to stand. Yeah, that's good. If the God of the universe dwells within you, if you have been made the righteousness of God, if you have been made holy and blameless in his sight, if you are a new creation, if you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, do you think you can touch the ark? If you can come before his throne of grace with confidence at any time, do you think you can touch the ark? You're made one with the triune God of the universe. So you guys, way to go. Yes. Congratulations. And so in our little group, let me tell you what happened in our group. For the rest of you who sat down, do you want, do you want to change, modify your position now here in a second? Okay. So I gave the answer and, and then somebody said, I would like to change my answer. Was this, I think this was Emily. Emily, I think it was Emily. It was, it was Emily. So Emily said, I'd like to change my answer. I would touch the ark right after you did. <laughs> what an answer. No, I can honestly tell you guys, if we found the ark of the covenant, I would be first in line and I would go up and I would touch it because I'm in Christ. He's made me perfect. He's made me holy. No fear. You did not receive a spirit of fear, but of power. You have the resurrected Christ dwelling within you. All right. Now, I, sorry. The curtain was torn. The curtain was torn. Mm -hmm. 
There's a new way to God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the next character, by the way, by the way, everything I do a class that shows that everything in that tabernacle points to Jesus in some way. It's a really cool symbolic representation. Everything points to Christ. But the last character, of course, is Jesus. And I kind of like scanning the internet and finding different portraits and paintings of Jesus in my classes. I always try to find the scene that I'm teaching about and portray it. But it's am amazing how many different ways Jesus is portrayed. This is kind of the Barry Manilow Jesus here. <laughs> Remember that from earlier? It kind of looks like that. But these are all pretty good looking guys, I would guess. This is an artist rendition. We talked about this last time a couple of weeks ago too. This is another artist's rendition of what a first century Jewish man would look like. And remember, it said of Jesus and his physical appearance that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So I don't think he was this, you know, model looking, you know, strong faced character. I think he looked like a first century Jewish man. But the biggest point of all is that Jesus is seen in the book of Revelation, not only in chapter one, because John sees Jesus, not only is in chapter two and chapter three, which are the seven letters to the seven churches, but Revelation 19, where we see Jesus coming back, riding on that white horse in that wonderful passage that I love to read. And he said in Acts chapter one, I'm sorry, the angels said in Acts chapter one of Jesus that he would come back in the same way you have seen him go. Well, he went up to heaven bodily, physically, visibly up to heaven. So he is going to come back bodily, physically, visibly to earth. In fact, he's coming back to the very spot that he left on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that cool? That's how he went up. And everybody was looking up at him go. They're all looking up. That's why the angel said to them, men of Galilee, what are you looking at? He went up to heaven. So when he comes back in Revelation 19, there's coming out of his mouth as a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I just never get tired of showing that picture. Here's another depiction of Jesus, King Jesus, the King of King and the Lord of Lords coming back to rule and to reign. Yeah. yeah. So in 19, like, what? That's the first time Jesus appears, right? Like I'm thinking about the rapture. Why isn't it then in the rapture? Because, it, you know, if you go back to Thessalonians, where yep. it's talking about Jesus. So hold that thought. In, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start discussing the rapture. So his question is, why isn't that thought the same as the rapture passage? We're going to look at the differences theologically between the rapture and the second coming. All right. So we're going to see which way are we going at the rapture? Up. Which way are we coming at the second coming? We're coming down. Where do we meet Jesus at the rapture? In the air. Where is Jesus going from and to in the second coming? He's going from heaven to earth, and we're following him. You know, we go up to meet him. We're following him down. We will walk through the differences, and we'll show that some believe they're one event. Many, you know, theologians believe that this is one event. I'm going to show you that they are distinguished. They're two separate events. And so for, when we start talking about the rapture, We'll first make the distinction between is this one event or two event? And I just gave you two of the reasons why I think they're two events. And then we'll discuss the timing of the rapture after that. All right. So hold that thought, but that's a very good observation. So, and see, we're coming with him. If we're coming with him, where did we have to be? We'd have to be up in heaven. When did we get there? Before that, that's right. Before that, we had to get there before that. That's going to be the rapture, and that's what we'll study. Okay. All right. What group in all of this discussion did we not see? 
The answer is already up there, right? <laughs> the church. I just found this picture today. I thought it was very pretty. The church. We do not see the church. We saw the church or what represents the church in Revelations 2 and 3, the letters to the churches. And then John is caught up to heaven in Revelation 4, verse 1. And I told you back then when we were looking at the book of Revelation that this looked awful lot like the rapture, didn't it? John, here's a voice like a trumpet, and he's caught up to heaven, just like the rapture. But then if you look at the rest of Revelation, all the way up till chapter 19, we can't find the church in the tribulation. Now, we know there are people who believe and are saved, this great multitude from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So we see believers, but we really don't see the church until we see the armies of heaven following her, dressed in fine linen. However, some say we see the saints in Revelation. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Who's the, this is the beast making war with who? Which saints? The tribulation saints. Who else are saints? 144,000. Who else? They're believers. Who else? All right, let me go. Let me define saints for you. Are you a saint? Yes. Yeah, we've talked about this, right? Are you hagios? Are you holy? Hagios, set apart. Have you been set apart yes. by God? Who else has God set apart in the world? Hmm? Israel, what'd you say? Israel. For you, Israel, are a holy people to the Lord your God. Out of all the people on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. God has called Israel out of all the nations of the world and set them apart. They are a holy people to God. I think the saints that you see in Revelation, and you see the word saint a couple times in Revelation, is not the church at all. I think it's Israel. That's exactly who the beast goes and makes war with, is the woman who we'll see is Israel, Revelation 12, is the woman Israel and her offspring, potentially the 144,000 that come to believe out of Israel, out of the 12,000 of the 12 tribes. So we don't see the church. Um, oh, what happened to the time here? I like this phrase a lot, and I usually do this right about this time. And I, I actually can't remember if I already mentioned this or not, but have you guys ever heard this phrase before? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And it sounds like really Christian and very biblical. The problem is it's not. We're not a sinner saved by grace. The Bible declares that the moment you believe and trust in Christ, you move from being a sinner in God's eyes to being a saint. That's your new identity. You're a new creation. So anytime someone says this, I kindly try to amend them. And I say, can I amend that just a little bit? Could you just say, I was a sinner saved by grace? Or better yet, Say, I'm just a saint saved by grace, because that's who you are. And I think that's our calling as Christians. You have been declared a saint by God, not by an organization or by a pope or a church or anything else, but by God has declared you holy, set apart for his purposes. And then he calls you to live out that sainthood, right? Right? But most Christians are kind of afraid to call themselves saints because there's a lot of baggage with that word, primarily from the Catholic Church, I would argue. And so we don't call ourselves saints. We're not saints, but God does. And in fact, Paul begins almost every letter with that word. Remember, 
to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Colossae. You are a saint. To the saints throughout Acadia, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, to the saints and faithful brethren at Colossae, you are a saint. Call your friend and neighbor right next to you a saint. Call them Saint Saint Julie. My wife, everybody here's my wife, Saint Julie. She is a saint. You are a saint. I was teaching this class one time. And I went through this slide and there was a guy in the front row. He had his three ring binder and he's sitting there and he, he slowly lifted it up like this. And it said, I'm a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, just cross that out and replace it with saint then. We're good. All right, so we saw the dragon. We saw the beast that comes out of the sea, out of the abyss. The beast who once was, now is not, is coming up out of the abyss. I think it's a man. I think it's really a man who once was, now is not, and is coming up out of the abyss. He's the Antichrist. And he's the one who the dragon is going to indwell at the midpoint of the tribulation. We have another beast in Revelation 13. He comes out of the earth. I think he's a Jew. I think he's the false prophet, the false Christ. Remember the unholy trinity discussion from last week? We saw a great multitude in heaven that come out of the great tribulation. One of the great purposes of this time is for many, many people to be saved. And we see that in Revelation 7. We also saw the 144,000 and the two witnesses. And so I think the sequence of events is God sends the two witnesses right away at the very beginning, right after the rapture, at the start of the tribulation, and probably from their testimony we see 144,000, 12 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel saved, and they go out into the world, but they are all killed for their faith, aren't they? Remember, they were all going to be beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus that they maintain. A quick question. Yeah. So who's the Pope then? So Pope, you're talking a lot about the Catholic Church. So. Yeah, so when I, so here, oh, the next one. Good question. So mystery Babylon that the beast that who was writing the beast described in Revelation 17 and 18. His question then, what, what about the Pope? Because the Pope is one of the common uh, candidates to be the Antichrist. But we see, or the false prophet. But we see Rome plays the role of the harlot of mystery Babylon. So that's the role of the church. I don't know about the person of the Pope per se, I, I, I think this is describing Rome. It's a great city. So not specifically the Pope, but the city of Rome, Vatican City. Does that make sense? Remember, four times it calls her a great city. Then we have Israel, we have Jesus, and we have the church, which is uh, missing from Revelation 4 through 19. Yeah. Um, so is, so the, the false prophet will come out of Israel. The Israel is not the false prophet because I think the false prophet is going to be a Jew. Oh, it's, it was the, the symbolism of coming, the beast, first beast coming up out of the sea, which can mean the Gentile nations and the false prophet coming out of the earth, which is the land, which can mean Israel. And, and. For a couple other reasons, remember I also mentioned Islamic eschatology and the parallels. They believe that Jesus is coming back. I believe that that Jesus is the false prophet. And then do you remember all the parallels of the descriptions of the false prophet and how they paralleled the real prophet, the true prophet. Remember the false prophet was a had horns like a lamb, did miracles, caused all great and small to worship the first beast and uh, did miracles and so on. Uh, imitating the Christ who was Jewish. So for several reasons, I believe the false prophet is uh, uh, going to be a Jew, but not Israel. God's got other plans for Israel that's, that we'll see next week. Um, boy, we're kind of out of time. Um, let's, I, I have some event slides and, and chart slides, and we are now officially a little behind. 
but that's okay. Uh, I'll make it up. Uh, and what we'll do is because um, we, shoot, because we didn't get to the trumpets and the bold judgments. Do you guys understand, do you see? I mean, how many of you think that the trumpet, understanding the details of the trumpets and bowls is, is a really big deal in all of this? Is it, a, is it a big deal? Or these are just kind of the details of the events that are going to happen. And we're kind of up here making big deals out of the big stuff, right? Uh, but we do need to talk about the locusts a little bit, you know, and this 200 million man army that comes. So if you, if you saw the chart in your book, I've got the seals and the trumpets and the bowl judgments, and they're all in there. And we'll talk about those briefly. And we'll, we'll finish putting some of the things on the chart. And the chart is also from your homework uh, from this week, right? So if you had trouble, a couple of people before class commented that I was struggling putting events on the timeline. And I said, well, the answer is in the back right here. It's all there. So, but bigger picture, are you getting a sense of this seven year period with some of the characters? Do you know all the detail yet? Well, no. Is it all that important that we know all the detail of all this? Well, no, we want the big picture stuff, right? Israel, what happens to Israel? That's a big picture item. So next week. So the last two weeks were kind of the, the, some of the details. And we, you know, we, we have a little more left over that we'll, we'll cover in building our timeline. How many of you are charters, by the way? How many like this kind of figuring out the timeline stuff? couple of you yeah so <laughs> well more more hands went up i i i can tell you i have drafts of my original charts and i still have them you know that i started you just compare scripture with scripture and you put events into place and compare it i have one chart i can't remember if i told you this it was in publisher this goes back a ways and it was like 15 pages by 15 pages and it just kind of built up item after item verse after verse and and I've only printed it one time. Remember, you print individual pages and then you have to tape it all together, right? And it's all folded up. It's still sitting in my old office uh, up on the top shelf. And, and I realized, well, I can't hand this out to anybody. <laughs> so I got to do something different. So I thought I can try to put it all on one page. And so that's our one page diagram. So we'll, we'll finish up a few of those little events and then move on to Israel next week. All right. Thoughts, questions? How many of you would touch the ark? <laughs> yeah. So when, when Satan gets thrown down, is, is Satan getting thrown out of heaven at that point? Yeah. So, but wasn't Satan, wasn't Satan kicked out of heaven like, and then went back up and then was thrown down again? Yes. Okay. So do you remember my chart of Satan's kind of progressive fall? Yeah. And I mentioned this briefly, but I, we just didn't have time to go into it. But really quick, he, was, he lost his position way back when. In Isaiah 14, I will, I will, I will. He rebelled against God, and he got kicked out. He lost his position, his role, right, uh, and became bad, became evil at that point. So he was cast out of heaven then. But does Satan still have access to the throne of God today? He does. So we see that both in Revelation, where he accuses the brethren day and night. We also see it actually in the book of Job, right, where he comes before Satan. Where have you been, Satan? Roaming around the earth, <laughs> looking for people to devour. Well, have you considered Job, right, and that whole conversation in Job chapter one? So he has still has access to accuse the believers. But at the midpoint of the tribulation, it's kind of like God saying, okay, done. You're gone. No more. I cast you down completely and utterly. No more audience before the throne of God at all. And that's when I think he indwells the Antichrist. Lord, we thank you that he is a defeated foe. You say greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We are victorious in Christ. In fact, you say, Paul says he that you always lead us in victorious procession. We have the right to come before your throne of grace. We confess to you, Lord, that we don't often enough use that access that we have. We are distracted by the cares of this world. 
and we go off and our mind gets distracted from the simple devotion of Christ. So Lord, help us and remind us through this study that we have Christ living and dwelling in us. We're a new creation. We are saints of God, of the most high God. And we can come before you anytime, bring our requests to you, to pray about everything, to not worry about anything, but to pray about everything. And then you say your peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That's the Jesus that's coming back. And we can't wait for that day, Lord, in your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. All right, Israel next week, all. Thank you. Stay warm. Have you seen the Commonwealth Games? No. What in the world is that? That was the Commonwealth. That was in Europe. And they brought out a beast. <laughs> you can watch it. Out. It's called 2002. You can't make this stuff up. All right. A few things out there that I've seen. It's like. Well, how do I stop? Where's my menu? Where is my menu? You said uh, Rome and Satan roaming around. I was wondering if that was a. Yeah. That's the same. Hang on, let me stop this. Yeah, I'll resume, folks. Thank you, guys. We will see you next week. Uh, this video, if I can figure out how to end it, will be up soon. Oh, here, stop recording.